It has been 10 years since we first met at the first Wushu Global Forum. It is time for us to pause, to reflect, and to aim for a more productive decade for our patients. In this opening plenary session, Changing the Games of R&D Productivity, our guest speakers will share their vision of how we can advance breakthroughs smarter, better, faster, and what could be potential game changers. Let's welcome David Berry, founder and CEO of Valo Health, Diego Morales, CEO of La Ronde, Roger Perlmutter, Chairman and CEO of Icon Therapeutics, Henriette Richter, Managing Partner at Sofanova Partners, and Session Leader Jorge Conde, General Partner at Andresine Horowitz. So first of all, uh, I want to thank everyone at Wuxi App Tech uh, for hosting us uh, today. Um, the topic we're hoping to cover is uh, changing the game in R&D. Um, before we jump into the topic, though, I want to thank this incredible group of panelists that have joined us today as well. So thank you all for, for joining me uh, here for this discussion. I'm very much looking forward to it. So diving in, um, you know, when we look at the topic of, of changing the game in R&D, one of the things that's really interesting um, is that this is the 10th anniversary uh, uh, of this panel, of this forum. And so I wanted to just take a quick look back, if we could, as a group, over what's transpired in our industry over the course of the last 10 years. And obviously, we couldn't cover everything in the, in the course of this panel. This is obviously a very long conversation. But I think what's striking to me is precisely that fact that so much has changed over the course of a decade in our industry. And, you know, we could just unpack a few things. Obviously, we've seen, you know, the, the arrival of multi-omics technologies. We're increasingly able to interrogate biology at, you know, you know incredible scale, uh, but also at, you know, incredible resolution going down to the single cell or even increasingly down to the single molecule level resolution. Um, we're generating uh, levels of data and types of data that we never have before. And we've also created an expanded arsenal of novel modalities that allow us to, to really increasingly use nature to, and, and engineer nature and program bits of biology to give us powerful new uh, potential therapeutics. And so why don't we start with a look back? And I'd love to go around the room because the folks uh, on this panel are working at every single one of these frontiers. Um, so maybe I'll start with you, Roger. Um, if you take a look back over the course of the last 10 years, what's, what's been most mind-blowing to you as someone who's been in this industry uh, throughout their career? Well, Jorge, I, as you outlined, an enormous amount has changed in the drug discovery and development arena. Uh, but it, it's hard not to recognize the profound impact of immuno-oncology. Uh, you know, and, and it's a bit personal for me, as you can understand, having led the development of pembrolizumab. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you had told me 10 years ago at the time of the first Uji conference, which where I was present, if you had said, gee, you know, you can block a single receptor ligand pair and reveal the pre-existing immunity in a substantial fraction of cancer patients and see tumors shrink and in many cases disappear, I would have said you were out of your mind. Uh, <laughs> and, and the reality is now we have not only the, the first generations of such uh, immune modulators, but subsequent add-ons that are all demonstrating increasing power. And the reason we have all of that is precisely because of the, the technologies that you mentioned that our increasing ability to manipulate chemical chemical matter, whether that's in the form of proteins uh, or macrocycles or small molecules, and to produce higher quality material and to assess the effects of that material in a variety of model systems that are better and better, uh, and where our precision of measurement is so much higher, has made an enormous difference. We're still surprised by these kinds of observations, the immuno-oncology one being you know, uh, an example par excellence mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but, but nevertheless, we have much better ways of interrogating that. And the quality of drugs that are being developed as a result, 10 years on, is much, much better. 
So do you, you know, Roger, if you look at where we are today um, on that last point, just to pick up on that, um, do you expect that, you know, as the quality of what's coming into the clinic is much higher than maybe it has been in the past for all the reasons you laid out, are you sort of predicting that there's going to be uh, sort of a, an explosion of novel therapies that are going to, you know, be arriving uh, for patients in the, in the relatively near future? I wish I could predict that, uh, Jorge, but but the reality is that uh, we, we are still stymied by the fact that we have very little understanding of normal human physiology. Uh, and because we don't understand normal human physiology, mm -hmm. we, of course, have no idea what's wrong with it when it's broken. And, and so, in a sense, it's a bloody miracle anytime you make a drug that uh, improves uh, a, a pathologic condition because you know, you really don't have a very deep understanding of the pathology. The reality is, of course, that almost all drugs that we introduce have their beneficial effect by introducing a countervailing pathology rather than by correcting what was wrong in the first place, except in those cases of, you know, gene replacement, Mendelian inheritance, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, sure. the, 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 the ultra-orphan diseases where you can, in, in principle, correct uh, an underlying defect. For most of the time, that's not what we're doing. And, and, and so... Uh, it, it is still a difficult, uh, time-consuming exercise where we're balancing benefit and risk. What I would argue to you, though, is that as you have, as you improve binding energies, and as you have compounds that are much more selective, that the chances of being able to have benefit risk uh, profiles that are superlative is much, much higher. And that, of course, improves clinical trial execution and ultimately brings greater benefit to patients and hence to society. And so if we if we were to take this, you know, this point that, you know, it's we, there's a, still a lot that we don't know um, about physiology, about disease states. Um, David, if I could pass it over to you, you know, one of the areas that you'd focus on a lot now is on using data. Um, to design better drugs, to make better decisions. Uh, what's the hope um, for the use of data um, in that realm? And, and where is there hype, if there is hype? Or I think it's a great question, Jorge. So let me touch on that from two different perspectives. And, and first, just, I'm going to build a little bit on, your, uh, on the history question that you, that you posed, which is, in the spirit of understanding recent history in the context of broader history, Right. We, of course, all know about the emergence of biotech as a subset of drug discovery and development um, from 40, 50 odd years ago. And in, the, in a way, you can think of biotech as the first digital innovation in the context of drug discovery and development. And I say that because at that point, one gene, one protein, one drug. And in the truest of sense, that is digital. Now, what we saw over 10 years was I like to what I like to think of as digital integration, this notion that you could take causal targets where they happen to be, mm -hmm. which isn't all over the place, and convert them very quickly into highly effective drugs, may vaccines, and how quickly they've been able to take genetic insights and make therapeutics out of them. But where we sit today, I think we're right at the cusp of what I like to think of as the digitally native era. And this gets exactly to what you were getting at, Jorge, which is that where we're sitting at, there's an opportunity that if we can pay attention to specifically high quality data, we have a unique opportunity to rethink the way we do drug discovery and development. And that is, it's really important to make sure we have the right quality data, the right type of data, the right density of data. And with that data, as long as it has physiological and pathophysiological relevance, with the density that's now available, we can start drawing very important inferences. And these are inferences that allow us to do things that previously were unimaginable. Sure, we can uncover targets, but we can much more routinely uncover targets of human disease, human caused disease with causality. We can uncover drugs that we can predict the probability of translating into the clinic with higher probabilities of success. And we can think about clinical trial design in ways that have a lot more impact, if you will, to specifically the patients we're looking to treat and avoiding the side effects in the ones where it's not necessarily going to work. And by doing these sorts of patient identification type of approaches, uh, anticipating progression, there's a fundamental opportunity where we can make 
drugs that are better suited for the patients that they're going into. And I think we're just at the beginning of that era, which is incredibly exciting, but it's data really at its core that drives that as the, as the foundation. And an important point there, I think that you would make is that it's not only the, the availability of, of more and different types of data, it's the ability to have um, technology aid us in making those inferences. That those inferences 100%. would be very difficult for us to make unaided. I think that's 100% right. And it's, it's not just having data in general. Also, it's also that the data has to be high quality. It's very easy to generate data. I think we've all spent too much time during our respective PhDs putting random cells on random plastic plates and getting data out of it. But I think we all know the correlation between that and uncovering causality in, uh, in disease. And so as we can start getting this really high quality data that's very relevant to the human condition, that gives us some pretty interesting insights as to how we can actually build that new, that new frontier. But it's not, again, exactly as you said, it's not the data alone. It's the computational insights that you can generate because frankly, the power of computation has got up, gotten to a point where with the scale of human data, which requires massive storage, massive computational efficiency, we can actually now engage on that in a meaningful way and draw out insights. I think it's I think it's a fascinating moment in time that we're at the cusp of being able to do that. Uh, speaking of the cusp, you know, the last couple of years in the pandemic have shown us the power of emerging new modalities. Um, and you know, I think I'm going to touch on a topic that's near and dear to Diego's heart. Um, this idea of the rise of um, you know programmable platforms or programmable medicines. Um, so we'll take mRNA uh, vaccines as obviously one very bright example that we've all been very fortunate to um, uh, benefit from. But um, Diego, over to you. How do you think about this shift um, uh, into the world of programmable platforms? And what, what is the implication of that for the future of R&D? If somebody had told me 10 years ago that you could actually ideate I mean, do some, I mean, uh, starting from scratch, you would discover a micro and it, you could ideate, design it, make it, had initial testing, put it into humans, conduct phase three tri trials of 35,000 patients and get it approved by regulatory agencies around the world in 10 months or 11 months, I would have said you are completely out of your mind. That is impossible, impossible. And so we have to reflect. I really think we live in a different world. And I know a lot of the scientific discoveries that David and Roger uh, uh, stated are, are huge, are huge. The fact that we can uncover the immunity of cancer, have people be cured of cancer with a drug, not with surgery, but with a drug. That's a miracle. But I think that, you know, and, and just imagine what the world would be if we hadn't been able to do that, imagine what the world would be if we hadn't been able to develop those vaccines in that time. I, I cannot imagine, look what it is the world with, with those vaccines. Imagine what it would be without those vaccines. So for me, that reflects such a, such a rapid progress, you know, from a scientific perspective, regulatory perspective, execution perspective, that is, it's, it's amazing. And I, I don't think, you know, now I'm working on, on programmable medicines. And I have to say, it has totally changed my mind in what's, in, the, in what's possible. Because I think a big challenge for us as an industry is the generation of the product, the product itself, the molecule that will, will have, you know, the biological effect in a human being. And I think it's a big bottleneck. I mean, it's hard to make a small molecule. It'll take you three, four, five years because there's so many things mm -hmm. you have to iterate and test that, you know, it's hard to predict. Antibodies the same. I think, you know, it's hard with cell therapy, with gene editing, with gene therapy. I mean, those are products that take a long time. With programmable medicines, as was shown, you know, during the pandemic, you could actually design and make the drug in three weeks. Of course, it was based on an incredible scientific foundation, understanding, you know, what are the antigenic elements that are most uh, effective to trigger in coronaviruses. And we've been working on that for the past 15 years, so we could do it. But the product generation, actually having the product, 1293 took, you know, two weeks. 
And that is incredible. And I think that that opens a whole new array of possibilities because now the complexities are in developing those uh, those drugs, in not in making and creating those products. So, but now, but now that you're in it right now, Diego, um, and you point out, I think it's it's in a, in a very compelling way that there was this sort of collective will uh, and urgency uh, to to move these vaccines forward in the in the face of the pandemic. Do you think that collective will and urgency will persist beyond the pandemic to other disease areas? Do you think that we can actually really harness the potential of these programmable medicines to get them uh, developed quickly and with urgency once we're past this pandemic? Develop and manufacture, because that's the other thing that is amazing. In the year 2019, we we're making about, the whole industry was making about 200,000 doses of messenger RNA. Next year, they're going to make between seven and eight billion doses. That, that scalability has not been seen with any pharmaceutical product in that period of time. It, that is also an amazing element of how programmable medicines, the product is so simple. It's so simple to manufacture the product. You know, it's synthetic, you know, it's enzymes and nucleotides and simple purification. So the product itself is extremely simple. I also think that is very, that is also very important versus other great therapeutic platforms that exist today, but where the product is a lot more complex and we all know the difficulties of bringing forward things, I mean, products that are a lot more complex. So I think it's, it's the, 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 I think that is a profound change in what is a pharmaceutical product, what programmable medicines uh, do. And David, that is the ultimate digital drug because you literally type it. You literally type the drug, press enter, and the plasmid arrives, you know, a week later. And um, then you rapidly make the drug. And, and that's, I think is, it forces us. I think it's, you, you ask, will it change? I don't know, but I think it should force us to think about how we can do things better and faster. Um, all of us, we, we really behooves us across all human diseases. The way that the industry was working or has been working is extremely inefficient. Mm -hmm. It's extremely efficient for a lot of drugs that patients are desperate. Like Roger said, you know, a lot of patients of cancer are dying waiting for drugs. I think we need to figure out how to do it faster. And that behooves all of us, the people, the discovery, um, developing, regulatory, manufacturing. We really should do better. And I think this is challenge us to do better. And that, that's a great point. Uh, Henry Jett, I would love to come over to you because you've had um, a front row seat to what's happened uh, with respect to innovation in our industry over the course of, of the last decade. You're, you're, of course, an active investor today. You're seeing firsthand all of these uh, advances, all of these explosions and novel modalities. So as an investor, I'd have to ask you, um, uh, you know, we're at this really interesting moment where innovation is advancing forward at the same time where there's capital available to fund and help translate all of these innovations. Do we as investors suffer from a, like from like a paradox of choice? Like how do you choose what amazing thing to support um, when there are amazing things coming to the fore, it feels like almost every day. Yeah, so it's it's a very good question over here. I think one of the things I want to mention that we have seen change and it, it plays into your question is really about the people and mm -hmm. the ability of people to connect in a different way across sectors. So if I look 10 years back, you would see biotech companies come in that were sort of living in, to be very general, in an isolation way. Today, when we have companies coming in, they always come with very solid academic collaborations. Uh, they also have already roots into the pharmaceutical uh, industry. And so this acknowledgement then, that if we want to get all the way to um, with a meaningful new uh, drug to patients, we will only get there if we collaborate. And that's something we're seeing uh, basically across all the strategies we have at Sofinova. Um, and so when, when we come to, to choose, because you're absolutely right, there's a huge push from innovation now. It's, it's, it's probably more that driving all the biotech financing we're seeing than the money in the market. That's my belief. Mm -hmm. um, 
um, some of the things we pay quite close attention to is, is exactly the, the people. How do they uh, how do they understand the uh, ecosystem, the environment, the the need to connect, the need to have all the links in order to 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 make the plan that they're proposing. Another thing we are seeing is is this, and it was touched upon uh, earlier in the conversation here is the ability to um, select the patients in a given indication they want to treat. So today, in contrast to what I would say 10 years ago, we would not invest in a company where you, where you don't have a causality and an ability to select or stratify your patients. And I think that's a very, very big change. And also, I think the ability to go into very large indications and do sub stratifications within those right. indications has opened up for several new uh, indication areas when it comes to biotech companies. And, and so here, of course, I'm thinking about the neurodegenerative space, the cardiovascular disease space. Um, but first, it really starts with the people and their ability to see the need to, to build that network around them. And, and that's, that's been a huge change from just 10 years ago. To, 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 to the Diego's point, we, of course, uh, also see the, the, the tech coming into the, or the, the tech meeting, the life science, we have companies like DNA Script, like Synthes, right, where you basically shortcut the whole supply chain, you liberate the, the, the scientists to think innovation instead of having to do sort of the heavy labor work in, in the lab. And, and, and by that, you speed up the process tremendously. Uh, the quality is higher. And so the overall output is, is, is just uh, superior compared to what we saw 10 years ago. So to, to pick up on two of those points, are there um, particular areas or particular technologies that that you and Sophie Nova are focused on and interested in now that were perhaps less feasible or less investable in, in the recent past? Yeah, so I think um, we are, of course, interested, and this is going to be areas that other of my colleagues would say we're we also looking into the, these areas, but this is, of course, gene and cell therapy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and where this is moving now, potentially going into also non-viral uh, larger segments uh, or inserts, right, to, to, to these diseases that, that we want to treat. Um, we are quite focused uh, on the autoimmune space where one of the things we think is uh, very interesting is, is this rebalancing of the immune system mm -hmm. and how you can really come in and, and, and look at the, the cell types there and instead of uh, potentially coming in with the cytokine alone, but really seeing how, how can you modulate uh, the system in, in a more, um, you can call it uh, less uh, or more human way uh, for, for the patients, right? Uh, we, we are also, when we con construct our portfolio of companies um, and when we look at these companies coming in, we are focused on diversifying between modalities. And that's another thing I think we've seen simply uh, blooming the last 10 years, the number of new modalities going from just, you know, small molecules and antibodies to a wealth of uh, modalities that we can now treat patients. And the combination of those we find very interesting. And I assume you're seeing innovation now in the form of, you know, early stage companies emerging from all over the globe. Oh, yes. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and that's another point. It comes a little bit back to connecting people. We are European focused fund, but we have a, a global reach. Almost all of our companies today, uh, they build out globally from the get go. And I think it's exactly to acknowledge uh, what you're just saying there, that um, that's, that's simply what you need to do in order to collect the best, uh, the, the best uh, scientists, the best operators and entrepreneurs um, to make your company succeed. So very seldom do we have these regional companies that we used to have 10 years ago, to, to, to your point. Excellent. Um, so we've talked about all of the amazing things that, that have happened over the course of the last 10 years. Um, can we take a second to talk about what still isn't working or what still needs massive improvement? And Roger, I'll pick up on a comment you made at the very outset of this conversation, which is we still d don't have a great sense of what's going on in physiology. And so therefore, a lot of the times um, we don't have high, you know, high predictability in terms of what will or will not work. So um, how do we think about better models or better ways to develop these therapies so that they are in fact, you know, uh, more likely to be successful? 
really a complicated problem, uh, Jorge, and, um, and others uh, will certainly jump in here. I, I think that there is a, a view, uh, and a view with which I have some sympathy, that, that the improvement in computational power and our ability to generate very large data sets and to interrogate them uh, in a multi-parameter kind of analytical format will yield insights that previously were unavailable. Obviously, you know, humans have great difficulty with this. <clears throat> Machines can do it much better. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we certainly see that uh, in a whole variety of different ways. And, and machine learning applied to clinical data uh, is already revealing insights that, that help us to build better models of human pathophysiology, which is really, no one can hope for understanding in, in that sense. That I, it's not a fair word, but what we can do is build models that uh, predict emergent properties of complex systems. And with those models, we can do better experiments. Obviously, we, we can't um, do a lot of experiments in people. Um, we have to have other better ways and getting some sort of, of improved rapprochement between uh, preclinical models and human systems is, is extremely important as well. Um, I, I would say my own experience in this currently as uh, it comes from uh, trying to look at the behavior of proteins in living cells. And that's an extremely small system we're talking about. It's not this grand business of, of using the power of machine learning to look at clinical data. Uh, but we are taking advantage of super resolution microscopy at Icon Therapeutics to look at the behavior of individual proteins in living cells. Uh, I had anticipated that this would be a many year exercise of, of exploring individual proteins that we fluorescently tag and we can visualize with 10 nanometer spatial resolution and 10 millisecond time resolution and isn't that fascinating and it has sort of a science fair aspect to it. Um, the, the thing that has been most remarkable for me over the last uh, eight months is how immediately relevant these observations are to modeling cellular homeostasis and drug effects in virtually every case. And, and so we've gone sort of instantly to using this movement of proteins in living cells, which after all, we previously couldn't appreciate Virtually everything we know about cell biochemistry comes from looking at frozen or fixed tissue. Uh, so so we, we never appreciated protein dynamics previously. And, and now the, our, our view is different. And what's enabled that is being able to process enormous amounts of data in a multi-parameter analysis. You know, we're producing currently around 15 terabytes of data a day, which far exceeds any human ability to analyze. And the computational power, and this is here, I'm picking up on things that David said and uh, Diego as well, the computational power applied to these kinds of measurements enables you to derive insights from a modeling perspective that ultimately could permit us, I think, to have better views of the underlying pathophysiology of disease that we can just then test clinically. Um, and, and then to Diego's point, we can, we can program in what those modulations ought to be and make them very quickly and bring them into the right kinds of patients, just as Henriette is saying. So, so I, I think there is the potential here for an integration of a lot of different technologies. It's worth building off a couple of the points I think that we're, that we're hearing. And I want to pick off one, pick off in particular one point that Henry, Henry Jetta was making, which is speaking to this broader theme that I think is coming up and that's there's a lot of technology that is now trying to democratize capabilities for drug discovery and development and this is very interesting in this field because on one hand data and computation done right has the power to democratize many of the tools and capabilities and that opens up this big what if scenario what if we empowered the brilliant minds across this industry to do just so much more and it's super exciting Yet at the same time, we have complexity. And I think Roger highlighted this very well. I like to think of it in the context of clinical trials, right? An average clinical trial has plus or minus 1800 variables that goes into it. An average human can think about what? Three to five variables. And so when you think about what differentiates some of the best 
clinical developers, they have an intuitive sense of what those most important variables are. But how do we actually capture that? And if we can start doing that in a much more systematic way, despite the fact that clinical trials still take time, we can increase the probability of success. And this ultimately is coming together to create a really interesting theme. And of course, this is a lot of what we spend time at Valo Health doing, where we're thinking about how we can use large scale, high quality human data to create a digitally native, vertically integrated pharmaceutical company. And it's in that context where what we think you can, one can do is really make the capabilities around drug discovery and development, high confidence, reusable, make them low friction, low cost. And when you, when you can ultimately do that, you can start looking across important diseases from cardiovascular disease to oncology to neurodegenerative disease. And our belief is that you can start making very, very powerful inroads. But all of this is right at this crux of pressures that we're seeing where the insights, the tools, the capability sets are growing at such, such a tremendous rate. The transformation that we're seeing is, is it's tremendous. But at the same time, we're dealing with a tremendous amount of complexity. And I think we have to embrace those two countervailing forces. And if we do that right, I think the future of this industry is something that's incredibly exciting. So what are the, what are the remaining biological problems to tackle? Of course, cancer remains one, you know, neurodegenerative conditions remain another. They are complex. I mean, understanding whether we can uh, regenerate a neuron with the same function and the same storage that it had before. I don't know whether it's even possible, but it's something that definitely is one of, of the challenges. I think it should be part of how we think about, you know, what, what we, the impact we want to have as an industry on, on the problems of the world. You know, I think that's, for me, that's a very important element of how we think about our impact. So there's, there's so much potential um, to have broad impact, Diego, as you laid out. I, 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 I once heard a, um, uh, the CEO of a startup, um, uh, you know, with, with the vision to have, uh, I think it was a hundred drugs in 10 years. Um, I, I don't know, a guy that I know named Diego. Crazy um, guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great guy. Um, so let's assume for a second that, you know, the, the power of these platforms, the, the programmability, their nature will enable us to do that. We still have to get, you know, these, you know, this, this ambition of call it a hundred drugs to patients. So even in this instance where we can develop design, program better medicines, better therapies that are more likely to be successful in clinical trials, we still have to get them through clinical trials. So while we can put better drugs into clinical trials, is there a hope for actually designing better clinical trials? Is there a hope that there'll be a, a, a significant advance in technology, in approach, in regulation that will help reform how we think about clinical trials or or, or is it just the necessary and this is the way it has to, to go? And it's just that becomes the bottleneck for making sure uh, medicines are safe and effective. Can I, can I take the first answer, if you guys don't mind? With HIV, with, you know, with quantitative PCR, one dose, one dose and you knew whether you had a drug or not, really. And you knew the potency. It was, it was amazing, all right? And you could do that in a non-human primate. And then it, it, it had very good parallels what happened in humans. And, you know, I've been wondering, for example, why am we doing the same with cancer? I mean, you should be able to understand, you know, through the, through the loads, a cell load or DNA load or whatever that is, how you are responding to a drug within days of actually receiving a drug, not waiting to see whether you have survival, you know, two years later, it's extremely difficult to conduct studies. Sometimes patients are left on studies where the drugs don't work you know, and, and, and they end up dying because we are not developing the means to be able to do better clinical trials. And like Roger was saying, once we understand those processes, I think we need to establish the surrogate markers that allow us on that impact. Yesterday or two days ago, there was, a, there was an AG, uh, uh, IgA and nephropathy drug approved on proteinuria, okay, based on proteinuria. Mm -hmm. That's a huge milestone. I mean, everybody was like, oh my God, there's a new milestone. But I wonder why did it take 20 years to say that you lower proteinuria and a drug is working? I mean, it, it seems like so basic at some level, but I think a lot of opportunities for me to move drugs faster by understanding surrogate markers that can lead to uh, an approval of a drug. 
Yeah, I mean, Diego, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and to, to go back to the, the most important point that you made, it's the ability to measure something, to measure something that's directly related to the pathologic process. And, and once you have that measurement, well, that's a powerful lever that you can use in the clinical trial setting. Certainly it's a powerful lever in, in a, a phase two environment. Does the darn thing work? Obviously that's, that's very important. In phase three, of course, you, you do have to deal with what benefit inures to the patient. It, 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 we, we, we had a lot of advantages in HIV because of course, we, we, we stood on the shoulders of giants with, with you know, a couple of hundred years of virology experience uh, from even before the time we knew what a virus was. So, so that we, we were able to say that if we fundamentally, if you have a viral mediated disease, you get rid of the virus, you get rid of the disease. OK, so I mean, it was pretty straightforward. Not so easy for other things. Imagine in Parkinson's disease, as an example, the basis of registration for a drug in Parkinson's disease. It's a patient diary. That's the basis of registration patient diary. Imagine what the signal to noise ratio has to be like in order for you to extract benefit from a patient diary. Just conducting such a study is enormously challenging. But then if you think, okay, so what am I going to do in order to have a better measurement of sort of the fundamentals in Parkinson's disease, spasticity, rigidity, you know, the, the ability to initiate movement. What am I going to do? somehow have to develop these measures and then show that they matter, that they Absolutely. matter directly. And so developing a surrogate marker that you can measure, great. And then you have to show that it matters. And it takes some time to do that. But absolutely, Diego, once you have that, I mean, you're, a, you're in a great position to do much more powerful clinical studies that, that are involved many fewer patients. So I know we're, we're short on time. Uh, Roger, you mentioned that you were present at the first of, of, of the of Wuxi events 10 years ago. Um, you know, I, I think we've done such a good job here today. I think it's very likely that this group gets invited to come back for the 20th anniversary 10 years from now. So if we're sitting here 10 years from now, um, uh, what does future Henry Jet think about this conversation? Uh, that's... <laughs> That's a difficult question. Okay. I think when the, the, what we see in 10 years from now is a complete um, overlap of technology or of, um, how to say, computational uh, technology into the life science space. And right now it's happening up until the clinic, I would say. We are still sort of trying to integrate it into doing better trials. I think in 10 years from now, we will be working in clouds. We will be asking our scientific questions for a computer, and that will help us to guide us uh, to do the next right thing. And it will go incredibly fast compared to what we're doing now. Do you think, does this group think we'll have cures in hand for diseases that we don't today, 10 years hence? Absolutely. Would you measure it by the handful? Um, yeah, probably. I think cures, cures are hard. I mm -hmm. mean, there, I, there we, will, we will have cures because particularly in the infectious disease realm, it is possible to cure things. Um, and there are many that we can approach and, and the tools are better and better. And Diego has spoken to that. So there's no doubt about that. Uh, cures for chronic uh, diseases, particularly degenerative diseases, that's a much harder problem. That's a much harder problem. And of course, as people live long, longer, fasting, fastest growing segment of the human population in the developed world, centenarians, right? You're going to have a lot of degenerative diseases that you have to deal with. And that's, that's challenging. But, but I think one part of that is also to accept the heterogeneity within a disease. Sure. And I think that's what we're still struggling with. We're trying to make groups of, 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 of diseases. And, and, and I think once we get to the point where we accept that these patients are so different in how they go through the diseases, we, we're going to be doing much better and trying to treat them. I, I think that's one of the things we will see as well in 10 years time from now. And that's where the data analysis that David has talked about is so powerful. Yeah. I think there's a, there's a set of other trends that we're gonna start seeing, right? Because as we start getting deeper and deeper into the data and start deeply understanding the physiology and pathophysiology that's associated with patients, the diseases, their progression, not only will we be able to figure out better ways to intervene to do clinical trials, because we can find those points in which a patient is about to progress. That makes it easier to find a statistical association that we can use to move forward 
faster towards approvals. But at the same time, it's also going to allow us to start understanding the prodrome, if you will, of disease, that which leads up to the typical manifestation. And if we can start deeply understanding the associated markers, if you will, the PD markers that are associated with disease, then what we can start doing is figure out how we can intervene very early in disease before disease sets in in very robust ways. And that will allow us to have, I think, some transformative approaches toward, to a whole set of diseases. I think part of what we've been starting to see, for example, in the context of Alzheimer's is that as a disease that obviously has ravaged so many patients and their families, by the time it's diagnosed, the damage it's done to the brain is widespread. Reversing that is one challenge. Slowing it is a very different challenge. Understanding it early, yet a different one. And obviously if you can get there before it started to set in, then obviously we know that we can have much better effects on patients long-term. Um, well, I, I know we're coming up on time here. So um, I think you know this conversation for me has been incredibly educational and enlightening. Um, and, and more than anything, I think it should give us all an incredible amount of hope uh, in terms of where the, the impact that this industry will have over the course of the next 10 years. Um, and so I want to thank everyone on this panel uh, for uh, sharing your insights and for making time to join us today. I want to again thank Wushi for, for hosting us. Um, and I will say that uh, 10 years from now, if I am on the 20th anniversary panel with this group, I think the thing that will amaze future Jorge the most is the fact that Diego hadn't aged a day in 10 years. So that will be <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> I want to thank everyone very much. Take care. Thank you.